Hi. Hi. You sound wonderful out there this morning singing. I've got some of that stuff going on that in here, so I kind of sound like a lounge singer this morning when I'm trying to sing, like I've been smoking for years. So I've got a little bit of hot tea up here. Hopefully that'll get me through here. Welcome to Women in the Word. My name is Vanita Jones, and I'm part of the teaching team, and as always, it is my great pleasure to be here with all of you this morning as we unpack this action-packed, action-packed part of Exodus. This stuff is not boring at all. You know, there have been very few Bible, Bible verses or Bible stories that have been set to um, movies, very few, and most of them, let's be honest, maybe because of production quality, they're a little cheesy, You've seen those. And then there's the ones that came out recently. I think Russell Crowe was in one. And didn't, he, he, they took away so much stuff or added so many weird things to it that it didn't even look like the Bible verse that we grew up reading and studying as children. But I bet every single one of you saw the movie, The Ten Commandments. I did. I did. I saw it a few times. And truth be told, probably more than a few times. It came out seven years before I was born, but every year about this time, it would be shown on the television, and it would grace our black and white TV every time, and it was, there was always preparation for it. We always had breakfast for dinner. Mom would make eggs, pancakes, and sausage, and when we get out those wonderful metal TV trays, it was such a treat, <laughs> and we would sit there and watch the Ten Commandments. I was fascinated with it, fascinated. And as, and as a child, I was mostly fascinated with the plagues. You know, it had everything in it that as a farm girl, we dealt with all the time, but in mass quantity. It had, we were, there were water sources that were affected. There were bugs and their crops were affected. There were livestock dying, all stuff that we dealt with all the time. But you know, I'm a very visual person. And as I'm reading through this, I don't know about you, but I've had a really hard time getting those cheesy production images out of my mind. I see Moses with that big white head of hair that glows and his face is glowing and, and, the, and the plagues are just cheesy. But I don't think it was anything like that at all. These plagues were horrific. And we've come to the final plague and it is a doozy. A doozy. Open up your Bible to Exodus 12, 29, and we're going to get started right away. I'm going to read the first few verses in this part. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, and he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. This 10th plague was the plague to end all plagues, literally. When, when Pharaoh refused to let God's people go, it was the straw that kept, broke the camel's back. God was done negotiating with Pharaoh, and he displayed his mighty power in the 10th plague, and he struck down all the firstborn sons in Egypt. And it says that there was not even an Egyptian household that was not affected by this. You know, I think this was a horrible, horrible plague by any, any imagine, imagination. You know, Shelley said last week that there would have been like 70,000 deaths that night in Egypt. It was a horrible plague. But you know what? I still see, as terrible as this plague is, I see God's fingerprints, fingerprints of mercy all over this part of Exodus. Even where he spared the Israelites, that's the easy one to see. But even with Pharaoh, the great and mighty Pharaoh, I think he showed him great mercy. You know, he gave him nine, nine plagues, nine different times to let his people go, and he didn't obey. He chose to harden his heart. But even before he sent that first plague, he showed his mercy by warning Pharaoh about the consequences of disobedience, or even partial obedience. And it wasn't a very subtle warning. Look at Exodus 4, 22 and 23 in your verse sheet. 
Now this is when God is speaking to Moses at the very beginning and he tells him, remember he gave him this little bag of miracles? He said, here's your staff, it turns into a snake. You can put your hand in your pocket, it becomes leprosy and then you heal it. And then you pour out water from the Nile and it turns to blood. And he tells Moses to go to Pharaoh and he says, take these things. But he says, I'm just gonna tell you Moses, he's not gonna listen, but go anyway. And then he says this, to Moses, he says, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, I will kill your firstborn son. We don't even have to read between the lines to get that one right. It's not even subtle at all. It's, it's, it's right there in his face. He knew exactly what was coming if he didn't obey. Now, we learned a while back in studying other parts of the Bible that the firstborn during the times of Moses and during biblical times, they held a great deal of responsibility and they also held a great deal of a privilege within the family. So for Egypt, and in Egypt, the firstborn son of Pharaoh was considered a god. So this was a very devastating loss for the Egyptians. And it says that there was a loud crying, loud crying coming from every single household in Egypt. But the scene in the, Isra in the Israelites' house, it's not recorded, but I imagine it being very, very different. See, in the Israelites' household, they had done everything that God had commanded them. They had killed the Passover lamb. They had taken the blood of the Passover lamb and they had painted it on the door frames of their homes. They had ate, they ate the blood or the, the meat of the Passover lamb as a family. And then they worshiped Yahweh God together as a family. And then I imagine them just sitting there patiently and quietly waiting waiting for their mighty God to, to deliver them from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And then it says it started at midnight. I think they would have been in there patiently waiting quietly and they would have heard that first cry of anguish. And then another and another and they would have grown louder and more frequent and more of them so much so I don't know how they stayed in their homes like they were commanded to do. Do you know the first thing I do when I hear a tornado siren? I run outside. <laughs> what is wrong with me? I run out the front door and I'm doing this to see if it's just a mistake. <laughs> they didn't do that. They stayed right where God told them to stay and they waited for the signal from Moses to go. And as the Egyptians were being killed, the firstborn of the Israelites were redeemed by the blood of the Passover lamb. And see, just like the firstborn of the Israelites, we're redeemed by the blood of our perfect, unblemished Passover lamb, Christ, just like the Israelites. You know, the sacrifice that Jesus made, it can be studied, it can be contemplated, it can, and it can be read over and over, but until we apply the blood of Christ to the door frames of our own heart, we have no hope of salvation, no hope of redemption. You know, we can read the Bible. You can attend Bible studies all week long. You can meditate on his truths. You can go to church every single Sunday. We can do all the prep work, all of it, just like the Israelites did, but you know what? At one point, it's go time for all of us too. At one point, it's time for us to take that next step and say yes. Say yes to God's deliverance from the bondage of his sin that he provided through his unblemished son, Jesus Christ. At one point, it's time for us to admit that we're sinners, repent of our sin, recognize and accept that Christ died and rose for us, and then it's time for us to take his blood and paint it on the door frames of our own hearts. And then we live with Christ as the king of our life. And then we're delivered from the bondage of sin and we'll get to spend eternity with him in heaven. At one time, it's go time for all of us. Let's continue reading. I'm gonna read the next few verses, starting with 31. I'm gonna read to verse 42. 
Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by the night and said, up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had done as Moses had told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver, gold, jewelry, and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked for. Thus they plundered the Egyptians." And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sokuth, about 600,000 men on foot. Besides women and children, a mixed multitude also went up with them, and and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked both and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years, and at the end of 430 years on that very day, <clears throat> all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt, so this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all of the people of Israel throughout their generations. Finally, finally, the 10th plague was the one that did it. It caused that guy, Pharaoh, to say, go. He didn't just say, didn't just say, go. He said, go and take everything you have and get out of here. I think if we could read between the lines here, he would have said, don't let the door hit you. Get out of here. And they did just that. And because they had listened and obeyed everything that God, through Moses, had commanded them, they were prepared for their deliverance. So guess what? It's go time. This is the exodus. This is it. This is what the whole book is entitled for this very moment in time. And it says they left in such a hurry that they didn't even have time to add leaven to their bread dough. They just wrapped it up in their, the bowl and all into their cloaks and they took everything they plundered from the Egyptians and they hit the road. You know, remember Shelley told us last week that the Israelites were able to obtain great wealth from the Egyptians because they had asked them for their valuables and God gave them favor in their sight and the Egyptians said, yeah. So they left with this great wealth. Is it really plundering though if it, if it was given to them willingly? I don't really understand that. It says plundering, so we're gonna go with that. It says they plundered the Egyptians in a very nice way is what it should say. <laughs> It wasn't plundering like they beat them up and took their stuff or anything like that. But, you know, there were three promises fulfilled at this time, at this very moment when they're delivered out of Egypt. The fact that that Israel left Egypt with all this great wealth, it fulfilled one of the three different promises. See, when they left, when when the Israelites entered Egypt, they weren't exactly poor to speak of, but there were only about 70 or so of them. So just by sheer numbers, they would have had less wealth. And now, after 400 years of captivity, and I think that's a huge thing to think about, 400 years of captivity, not 400 years of being entrepreneurs in a huge city where they could acquire wealth. They were in captivity. They left with great wealth. Some of it they acquired because their livestock, their flocks had grown, and some they had gotten when they plundered the Egyptians but they left with great wealth. Look at Genesis 15, 13, and 14 on your verse sheet. God had caused Abram to fall into a deep sleep, and then he reveals this promise to him. He says, then the Lord said to Abram, Abram, now for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on this nation as they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. And they did. It's exactly what happened. They did that in captivity. Now, did you notice that in verses 37 and 38, it says they left with about 600 men, 600,000 men. See, the commentaries I read said if you do the math, include the women, children, and anybody else that went with them, it would have been over 2 million, 2 million people. That's saying that Moses would have pulled out of his driveway in Egypt He would have set out on his road trip to the promised land with two million people. 
that doesn't even include all the animals that would have been with him. You know, the Israelites leaving two million strong was the second fulfillment of a promise. We find that in Genesis 12, 2, the first part of that verse. God is talking to Abram and he says this, I will make you a great nation. He did it while they were in captivity. He made them a great nation. He definitely did that. You know, there, I think there's a great lesson found in the fact that they were able to thrive while they were in captivity. You know, most of the time, any of us, we barely survive at best when we're living through harsh conditions. We feel like we're captives of something that we just can't get out of. But God's people didn't just survive, they thrived. They thrived. They grew in strength and number. Remember back with me at Exodus 1 on your verse sheet, specifically verses 5 through 7. It says, all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph is already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceeding, exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. They entered Egypt 430 years prior with just 70 people or so, and now they're leaving 2 million people strong. They had truly increased and multiplied during their time in captivity. And if we look at Exodus 12, 38, we can see a third promise fulfilled with Israel's departure from Egypt. It says there was a mixed multitude that also went up with them. This would have meant that, there, meant that there were others with them that were not Israelites. They would have not been descendants of Abraham or Israel. But apparently, they joined the Israelites as they left Egypt. Now, I have to tell you, if I lived through those 10 plagues, I think I would have been turning tail and running with the Israelites as well. I think I would have told my gods to move aside and I was gonna go with their God. That would have been enough to turn me. <clears throat> but this group, this, this started the fulfillment of the promise that found later in the part of, it's, it's found in Genesis 12 2, the latter part of that. And then verse three, it says, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will, shall be blessed. See, the descendants of Abraham had become a blessing to the nation of Egypt. So much so that some of them left with them. Now, the non-Israelites leaving in this exodus starts the fulfillment of this promise, but actually the ultimate promise, the fulfillment, comes later when Christ, is, when Christ is born. Look at Galatians, uh, uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. It's chapter three, verse seven and nine. It says, knowing then that those of faith who are sons of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, we're considered Gentiles, Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are in the faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. They're talking about us. That's the, the, the ultimate fulfillment of that, that promise. See, the Israelites had not only survived their 430 years of captivity, but they believed the Yahweh God would do everything that he had promised them even if it wasn't in their time, even if it came several generations later and they thrived during their time in captivity. You know, like the Israelites, when we trust in God's promises, we're able to do far more than just survive our trials. We're able to thrive. We're able to grow and, and be strengthened right through anything that we're going through. You know, Moses is the only one that knows a little bit about road trips with multiple people and animals. I know a little bit about this as well. For the last 22 years, the Jones family has taken a 14-hour road trip one way, 14 hours back, to Colorado. And like the Israelites, our journey started out a little small. And the first road trip to the mountain house in Colorado was just four of us, two dogs. It was my husband, Cameron, and I, and then our older two children, Riley and Taylor, and our two dogs. A little bit later, we added Casey to that group, and he was about three months old when he made his first trip to the mountain house. And then a very short time later, much shorter than any of us planned, if you know what I mean, <laughs> our little Christmas surprise named Khaki came along and she made her first trip to the mountain house when she was only six months old. See, the Joneses were also increasing in number and in strength, just like the Israelites. <laughs> and so now, 
This time, 22 years later, guess what? Now it's grown from those two kids, two adults, two dogs, 22 years ago. Now it's a whole caravan of SUVs. And everybody's friends are going. All the kids take four or five friends. They all have their own dogs. And this is, we have enough food on this trip to feed a small army as we go out on this trip. You know, it's fun to sit and just laugh and talk about all the stuff that's happened on those trips. Some of it has been mountaintops experiences. Some of them not so much. But it's still good to remember all those times. You know, there was the one time that it, some of them are a lot funnier now than they were then. For instance, there was one time on the road back, um, our two youngest were under the age of three. Every single person and animal in our car, including the driver and the two babysitters that were with us, had thrown up at least once. <clears throat> and the two younger ones under the age of three, each had had at least one explosive diarrhea episode. <laughs> I remember my husband finally slamming the door on the last episode saying, this is not a trip. No, this is a trip, not a vacation. <laughs> and that's become our saying now, whenever this is truly a trip or this is a vacation. They're totally different to us. <laughs> well, there was a time that we had like six cars in tow, all of us in this caravan, and my husband, who just tends to drive a little too fast all the time, he gets all of us pulled over, all six cars. <laughs> and every single driver in the caravan got a ticket. And three of them were our own, our own family. So we were paying for three speeding tickets. A pricey road trip. But still, it's just fun to sit down with our kids and our friends and we relive these moments and they get funnier as we tell them again. And, and when then we realize just how God provided for us every time we've taken this road trip. In fact, we're getting ready to take it again in two weeks. And this time it'll just be my husband and I driving on our road trip. It's gonna be so different than having all those kids in tow. But you know, I wonder if the Israelites ever sat around their campfires and retold the stories of their road trip out of Egypt. You know, with two million people and all those animals, there had to be some pretty interesting stories told around that campfire. And I bet there were some funny ones too. Funny, funny stories. You know, remembering our past journeys of deliverance, it's a great way to remember God's faithfulness. And it's great to, to pass those remembrances of faithfulness on to our own children, our extended family members, and, and to our friends. You know, it's not just my idea to do this. It's, it's completely God's idea. And he was very specific about the matter of remembrance for the Israelites. Let's continue reading. I'm gonna start in verse 43. And I'm going to read to 3, 6, or 13, 16. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is a statute of Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in your house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. All the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And at that very day, the Lord brought the people out of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their host. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and beast, is mine. Then Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for you had, by a strong hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib you are going out, and when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and all the other rites he's that he swore to us, to, and to your fathers, to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. You shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat and you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day thou shalt be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall not be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of the, what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep the statute at its appointed time from year to year. 
When the, when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites as he swore to you and your fathers and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all the first, open, all the first that opens a womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey shall be, you shall redeem with a lamb, or you will not, if you do not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of a man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time it, you come to your, your son ask you, what does it mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be a mark on your hand or frontless between your eyes, for a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. <clears throat> God has established three celebrations that are to be perpetual reminders of God's deliverance. And the Israelites, along with this mixed multitude of foreigners, had departed Egypt. And verses 43 through 51, God is addressing the topic of the Passover with foreigners in their midst. See, he'd already established the Passover back in the early part of chapter 12, but now he's laying out the specifics of this feast when dealing with outsiders. The Passover feast was to remind them how God had provided them as an escape from his wrath in the 10th plague. Now, in an attempt to make this very concise, here are those instructions. No one was to partake of the Passover unless they were circumcised. So the foreigners traveling with them, they could only join in if they would align themselves with Yahweh God and were sacrificed. Or, or were not sacrificed, were circumcised. <laughs> sacrificed. <laughs> or you'd be sacrificed. They had to be circumcised. They probably felt like they were being sacrificed. <laughs> If you remember, remember back, we studied a whole lot about circumcision. Do you remember that? It was last, I don't know, when we studied Genesis. We talked a lot about it. And any time someone was circumcised, it was a sign that they belonged to the community of faith. And we see in this verse that it qualified them also to participate in Passover feast. Now, basically, if they wanted to participate, they had to be circumcised. If not, they couldn't. And this feast was supposed to be celebrated in their, as, a as a community, but individually in their homes. And they were instructed back in chapter 12 exactly what to do. But now there's some things added to this. He says that they're not to take the meal outside their homes, and they're not to break the bones of the sacrificed animal. You know, every single piece of the Passover, and I hope you're seeing this, points us to Christ and his redemptive work for us. This part's no different. In fact, it has great prophetic significance. Look at John 19 on your verse sheet. It says, so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once that there came out blood and water. He who saw it was born witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. See, just as the bones of the Passover lamb was not to be broken, John tells us in his recording of the crucifixion that the bones of Christ, the perfect Passover lamb, his bones were left unbroken as well. Now, I mentioned earlier that God called Israel his firstborn. And God redeemed his firstborn of the Israelites when he carried out his 10th plague. And then he struck down all the firstborn of the Egyptians. The consecration of the firstborn would remind the Israelites of this very thing. And in this, God is commanding the Israelites to dedicate their firstborn. It's, it's, the, it's kind of the first fruits. And they're to, they're to dedicate that child back to God. And then they offer a sacrifice to redeem that child back. Now, if it was an animal, they actually dedicated it and it was sacrificed. <clears throat> but a child, they would redeem. Now, later on in, in the New Testament, we see another example of the consecration of the firstborn. Look at Luke 2, 22 through 24 in your verse sheet. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they're talking about Mary and Joseph, they brought him, Jesus, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written to, in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the, Lord, the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. I think it's a beautiful picture of obedience as we watch Mary and Joseph obeying these commands to consecrate the firstborn son, Jesus, back to God. And then they redeem him 
with, with a pair of turtle loves or a pair of young pigeons because they didn't have the price that they, they needed to pay for a lamb. They didn't know that they had the perfect lamb of God right there, the unblemished lamb in their own arms. And he was the perfect lamb who would one day be sacrificed to redeem the lost, including Mary and Joseph, his own parents. Now, in addition to the Passover and the consecration of the firstborn, the Israelites were instructed on the specifics of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And I think we get very clearly from what was written, they weren't supposed to have any leaven for seven days at all. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread sometimes is mistaken for Passover. In fact, in the Gospels, they're almost referred to as the same thing, but they're actually different. The Passover is a 24-hour period, and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread is seven days. And on the evening after Passover, God told the Hebrew people exiting Egypt not to allow their bread dough to rise, but to grab everything out, everything and leave. He said, don't even let any leavening touch the dough. Just take it and go. Wrap it in your cloak. And in their haste, they grabbed that ne the necessities and they fled toward the promised land. And they, when they do this now, it's to commemorate that very moment in time. The celebration was to remind them in the haste in which God delivered them from the bondage in, in Egypt. These three celebrations had one primary purpose, and that was they were to be purposeful events commanded by God that would remind the Israelites that with a strong hand, the Lord had delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. And along with these instructions, he said it over and over, he said to be quick to share the stories of deliverance with their children. Something tells me they did exactly that. They did exactly what God told them about that. Because you know what? Here we are today in 2017, and we're studying the Exodus. We're studying the story of the Israelites leaving bondage in Egypt. I think God was onto something here. You know, he not only told them to share it with their children, he gave them very specific, purposeful ways to do it. See, if we're in Christ, we have a story of deliverance. Just like the Israelites, we were held captive in bondage, in bondage of sin. God, in his great mercy, gave us a plan of escape, and he prompted, and, and his prompting, we, at one point in our story, we took that step. We stepped into his deliverance, and, our, and away from our sinful natures, and we set out with Christ on our very own journey of faith. Some of you, like the Israelites, may have a very dramatic very dramatic story of redemption. I've heard some of them. They're amazing. And some of them may be very quiet, less dramatic. But they're very powerful, none, both the same. If you're in Christ, you have a story to tell. And God makes it very clear that if we, that we need to be purposeful in sharing this story, especially with our very own family. See, when we're purposeful in sharing God's faithfulness, others are encouraged and our faith is strengthened. Sharing our story of faith may be that one thing that someone else needs to hear to spur, spur them on to take that next step their next step in their own story of deliverance. And sharing our story reminds us of God's goodness and God's faithfulness in our past. And then it helps us to be strong and face our futures. Some of them are very un un unclear and, and very uncertain. Let's finish up. I'm gonna read the last few verses, starting at 17. <clears throat> when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by way of their wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. And Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sokoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not part from before the people. <clears throat> See, the Israelites had departed two million people strong, and now they're making their way toward the promised land. It says that God did not lead them by way of the land. 
which, by the way, was the shortest route from point A to point B. But God had his reasons for taking them on the long way to the promised land. Just because the other way was shorter, it was not going to be better. The shorter route would have taken them through the land of the powerful Philistines. And they, were, they were, would have been terrified. It says his people were great in number and strength, but he knew that even though they left in battle formation, they were not completely battle ready. And he knew that if they faced the powerful army of the Philistines, they would have turned tail and run straight back to be slaves in Egypt. And it, as it turns out, he was right. Because if we read further on, and we're gonna see this later on, or you may see it later on if you ever study this, when they get to the outskirts of Canaan, they send spies in, and the spies come back and say, they're just giants. We're like little grasshoppers to these people. And what was the first thing that came out of their mouths? They said, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. God knew. God knew what they were gonna do. They would rather return to slavery than to face the battle ahead of them, even after they had seen everything that God had done for them. Because remember, by then, he had parted the Red Sea. He had fed them with manna. He had let them out. He had saved their lives in Egypt, all of the stuff they had seen. And they were ready to run back to Egypt. It's kind of astounding to me. But you know, I'm guilty of the very same thing. You know, out of fear... I'll return to slavery as sin. I'll get in a scary situation, and what do I do first? I try to manipulate people. I try to control the circumstances. Try to get people to do what I think they ought to do. And, and I fall back into any sin that I'm prone to fall into when I allow fear to rule my life. You know, it's been said that this journey of the Israelites, I read this somewhere, that from Egypt to the Promised Land should have taken two weeks. It took them 40 years. 40 years. Now, some of that was because of their own disobedience. But God had carefully planned the Israelites. He had carefully planned their trip to the promised land. And it did not include what by human standards may have seemed reasonable. Or maybe a better plan. But it was laid out by God to protect and prepare his people for the promised land. He may not always take us on the shortest route. I can attest to that. But he always takes us on the best route. And even if by human standards, it seems hard to understand, it's the best route. God has other purposes in mind involving much more than moving us from point A to point B. And if you're like me, you're gonna be tempted to doubt God's plan along the way, but we can, be, we can rest and be assured that he's working all things out for our good. See, his ways are not our ways, thank goodness. And, the very, and very often his journey from point A to point B may look very different than anything we could have planned for our lives or would have planned for our lives. But we need to remember that just like the Israelites, he has carefully planned our journey. And just like he did for the Israelites, he, all he wants from us is to trust and obey. That's all he needs. You know, I mentioned early that when, we left, when they left Egypt, they took some of the Egyptians' riches, but we also saw in verse 19, they also took something else, or should I say someone else? They took Joseph. They carried Joseph's reign with them. They took his, his bones with them, and by doing this, they were carrying out his last wishes. Look at Genesis 50 on your verse sheet. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And we know the rest of the story. He gets to make the trip to the promised land. They carried his remains with them on this journey to the promised land. And by doing so, just like Joseph, they were saying, we believe what God said. We believe that God will do what he promised us. And I'm sure that as Israel carried Joseph's remains with them, their faith was strengthened every time they looked at that coffin. Like Joseph and the Israelites, God had given each of us amazing promises as well. And reading the story of the Exodus, it should remind all of us that God was a promise keeper 
And he's still in the business of keeping promises. And in the last few verses of chapter 13, we see the wonderful provision that God gave to Israel to guide them by day and by night. He gave them an obvious sign of his presence. He gave them a cloud to follow during the day and fire to guide them at night. God's presence guided and comforted the Israelites as they made their journey through this wilderness. Scripture also tells us that God on occasion spoke from that cloud and that fire. In Numbers, we see where he speaks to Aaron and Miriam. And in Deuteronomy, we see where he speaks to Moses out of a cloud. And likewise, God is with us. And he speaks to us. He guides us. He comforts us. Not with a cloud. Not by fire. But with something even better. It's his very own spirit. See, his spirit is not just with us. It is in us. See, with the Old Testament believers, God was with his people. But in the New Testament, he not only dwells with us. He dwells in us. Look at John 14, verse 17. Even the spirit of truth in the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. As you and I journey in this life, maneuvering through all the different things that we go through, taking the long way to the promised land, some of us, know that as, just like the Israelites, as followers of Christ, we're not alone. Our God not only dwells among us and speaks to us, he dwells in us as well. We may not have that cloud and we may not have a pillar of fire, but God provides his Holy Spirit and his Holy Word to guide us on our very own journeys of faith. Please pray with me. Precious Father, we love you, we love your word. Father, I pray that as each one of us face our own journeys, that we would uh, just remember and remember well, very purposely, how you've cared for us in the past and know that your plan for us is so much better than we could ever plan. Father, I pray that as we go out of here that these words are embedded in our hearts and that Lord, we are willing and bold and free and purposeful in sharing our story with others. In Christ's name I pray this, amen.